Terry, I, in reading your books and being, I'm going to call myself a student at this point, I'm, I'm getting there quickly. Um, and definitely a, a, a fan and so respectful of what you're doing. I'm eager to hear this on the personal side. I mean, I know you start off the book and you talk about your own, you lead into it with your own troubled childhood and your own journey, and it makes you so relatable. And so I'm eager to hear some of the, yeah, the values and practices that you have here. And, and also your commentary on where you see us in relationship, your expertise, where you see us go by the wayside, honestly, you know, so let's start off with, with spiritual, which is one that you, uh, you hit on. So well, I feel like you write in a way that would say, how can you do what you do and talk about relationships without a spiritual aspect? So tell me about that side of your life. Well, look, uh, I've been meditating over 50 years, uh, on and off. And I, I've been a daily meditator forever. My, my wife and I, uh, start off every morning, knee to knee, in mm. in, in bed, uh, meditating 45 minutes. It's a beautiful uh, way to begin our day. Uh, spiritual life is very important to me. Um, I write about this uh, in, in the epilogue of the book. You know, psychologists talk about basic trust, uh, which is supposed to develop kids at about two years old. Basic mm. trust is the essentially optimistic uh, sort of world energy uh, <clears throat> that uh, things are going to work out, it's going to be okay. You know, I love this. Uh, late in his, very late in his life, near death, <laughs> Albert Einstein was asked by a journalist, Professor, uh, at, at this stage of your life, what would you say the most important question is? Uh, and you expect some, you know, physics. He says, uh, the most important question uh, is this, is the universe a friendly place? Wow. Safety again. Yeah. Is that yeah. profound? Yeah. It, 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 it is the life force benevolent or random or malevolent? Basic trust is a fundamental building block of a healthy personality it's supposed to come at two that things are going to work out but as i say in the book how much basic trust uh, are you supposed to have uh, when someone four times your size uh, capriciously and episodically acts like they hate you yeah either violently or negligently or both uh I speak about my own journey. All relational life therapists speak about our own journey. Our authority is not our schooling. It's our own relational recovery practice in our lives. I grew up in a dysfunctional family, just like you, most of us. I grew up in a dysfunctional society, just like you, all of us. I had to learn how to heal. I had to learn how to have relationships, the skills, that I'm downloading to you are the skills my wife Belinda and I use every day. Uh, on those days when the adaptive child in either of us gets us and we don't use those skills, uh, we look just as ugly as you do. My clients love hearing that. I'm just a human being like the rest of you. The spiritual piece is this. We therapists are always asking our clients to let go. But you can't let go unless there's something to let go into. You're not going to dive off the board without water in the pool. There must be some sense of the spirit or life force or inspire, whatever the hell you, I don't care what you call it, uh, that is uh, uh, pervasive that uh, surrounds and supports you and that it is ultimately benevolent. And if you don't have that sense, uh, it's really hard to let go of the delusion of uh, control, which is really mostly driven by entitlement and fear and grandiosity. So moving into humility, I'm not above nature, I'm a part of nature. Uh, really expand, uh, it extends to a spiritual practice. The, the, the practice that 
most speaks to me, and I've done them all, uh, is Taoism, T-A-O. Uh, it's a precursor to Zen. And, um, oh my gosh. Well, you made me do this. I, I, I have to read uh, one uh, poem, uh, which I closed the book with. So hold on one sec. Here we go. This is from a Taoist master, Lao Tzu, written, are you ready? 6,000 years ago. Okay. 6,000 years ago. Okay. Here's the poem. In harmony with the Tao, the spirit, in harmony with the Tao, the sky is clear and spacious. The earth is solid and full. All creatures flourish together, content with the way they are endlessly repeating themselves, endlessly renewed. When man interferes with the Tao, the sky becomes filthy, the earth becomes depleted, the equilibrium crumbles, creatures become extinct. Mm. The master views the parts with compassion because he understands the whole. Wow. 6,000 years ago. Think it's relevant? I think it's relevant. I think it's relevant. It reminds me even of, you know, on a, on a level people know AA and they seem to not be able to really do what they do without some recognition of a greater power, a greater yeah. purpose. Well, and on that, so purpose, and you mentioned this in the first show, you talk about it in your book and where we find, and I've seen this experientially my entire life in the personal development, the self-help business, that where we find in business, even where we find the greatest purpose is our second category here is relationships. And as you brought us to in the first show where I was questioning if safety is really the thing that we want most. And you said, yes, in the maladaptive child aspect, it is. But when you, as a wise adult, what do we want? And you said, connectedness. So tell me about the values that you have and see needed in relationships. And I'll just put that in there, connectedness as well. Or maybe that is it. It's connectedness. Maybe that's the answer. Yeah, that is the value. It's, okay. it's in a connection at, at every level. Um, connecting and so many men and women and non-binary people in our culture suffer disconnection, you know, trauma disconnects us. That's what it does. Uh, that's what it is. Trauma is always uh, a disruption in the relational field. Mm. Uh, you can't be in a moment where you're enjoying a, a, a functioning holding environment and be traumatized at the same time. By definition, trauma means that field has been destroyed, uh, ruptured in the moment. So connection, disconnection, uh from our bodies which breeds so much disease from our minds uh we just did an exercise in the first part of the show where i ran through getting in touch with your feelings uh disconnection uh, from our wants and needs so many women uh, uh traditionally socialized have a hard time asserting their one you know we say Neither men nor women have voice in their relationship. Uh, women uh, are socialized, I mean, feminism has helped, but traditionally women have been socialized to think that wanting something is selfish. A good woman has no needs, they serve the needs of others. And men are socialized to think that wanting something is weak. I'm Superman, what, I don't want anything, I'm perfect. Yeah. Uh, so we're both walking around uh, in versions of not being human with each other. And then we wonder why we have so much difficulty getting along. So connection to our bodies, connection to our hearts, connection to our feelings, connection to our wants and needs. Um, I make a distinction. I'm glad this has come up. I do this with a lot of guys. I have very high powered, you know, captains of industry, multi-gazillionaire. And I talk with them about the difference between gratification and relational joy. 
Mm. Gratification, which our culture runs on, is a short-term hit of pleasure. You know, you make a killing in the stock market, you close the deal, a pretty girl smiles at you, whatever. It's great. Great in its place. I don't, I, I like pleasure. Relational joy is a deeper down pleasure. That's not about doing or having, it's about being. And it's just the pleasure of being there and being connected. Parenting uh, is the easiest place to uh, uh, scan for relational joy. You know, I tell a story if I can. Please. Well, uh, my, my kid now is 32, he's got an MD, PhD. Uh, and he also danced for the LA Ballet. He's a spectacular kid. But when, when he was little, he was a terror. And I, I was giving him a little time out in his room. We didn't have locks on the door. So I'm holding the door shut and he's trying to get it open. You know, he's about this big, right? But I'm telling you, man, lightning was coming out of his, I mean, clouds. Were, it, was, it was like a horror. It was like poltergeist. The whole house was shaking. Mm -hmm. And while one part of me was like, so mad, I don't want to throw him out the window. Another part of me was like, you mighty little spirit, you. You're going to do just fine in this world. Sometimes our relationships are gratifying. Sometimes they're a royal pain in the neck. But there's a deeper down pleasure that's below those waves. It's steady as a rock. I love being here because I love being here period, end of story. That's relational joy. Now, a lot of the high-powered men I treat have little to no experience of relational joy, and I have to teach it to them. I had a guy, true story, had to be worth 100 million bucks, already brought two companies public and sold them. He was in his early 40s. Beautiful wife, kids, blah, 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 German guy, had no joy in his life not a moment of joy. So I explained this to him. And I say, come on, Keep a moment somewhere in your life, you have no experience. He said, no, you know what? Now that you bring it up, there are rare moments when I'm on my hands and knees playing horsey with my kids, my two little kids. And I lose myself and I feel joy. I go, that's it. That's what you want. And I swear this true story, he, he called me a month later and he said, my life is completely transformed. He said, I live for relational joy now. I play with my kids. I've cut back my work. I sit on the porch and talk to my wife. I never even knew who she was. I never paid attention to her. My whole life is different and I'm experiencing joy for the first time in my life. It reminds me of just a deeper appetite. And, and we're, as you know, culturally, we're called it the microwave society forever. But I feel like that even with our pleasures, we're, we'll so quickly take that momentary gratification and not invest for that deeper appetite, that deeper joy. And until you taste it, it's really hard to sell. Yeah, it's true. But we've all tasted it yeah. in moments. Well, taste, good segue into health and wellness. And I, I do want some literalness on this, on what you okay. do, honestly, for diet, exercise. What are the things that Terry Real does to uh, stay healthy and able to write the next book? Well, I don't know if I'm going to be writing another book. I may be uh, on the beach hanging out with my family. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. The next um, endeavor, well, to do that with, with health and vitality and clarity, what do you do? Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm 72 years old. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you a, a straight out, Kevin, uh, while all of this has been happening to me, uh, while the book became a New York times bestseller, which it did a couple weeks ago. Yes. Congratulations. I saw that. You. Uh, I have also been dealing with not one, but two cancers. Wow. Uh, I had a uh, carcinoid, uh, it's a very slow growing cancer, very friendly cancer, uh, removed from uh, my lung and then they discovered liver cancer. Uh, and so I've had two back-to-back -back surgeries, major surgeries. I'm cancer-free wow. and I tend to stay that way. 
but um, I take care and, and I have for a long time. I, um, I exercise, I walk every day, uh, 30 minutes to an hour every day, you, uh, often uphill. Um, I do weight training a couple times a week. Uh, because of the cancer, I'm changing, I'm radically changing my diet. Okay. Uh, no meat, no sugar, no white flour. Uh, I'm going plant-based. Um, but um, uh, the main thing that I do to keep myself physically uh, healthy uh, is uh, I hang out and have a great time with my wife. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we can't wait to dive into bed and uh, uh, watch, this, uh, one of, watch some stupid movie or show and uh, hold each other. Uh, at night when we go to sleep, uh, we tell each other how much we love each other. And I thank her every night. Uh, and uh, my kid, in fact, somebody's making a documentary about my work and my family. It'll, it'll be coming out in about a year and a half or two years. My kids are incredibly relational. Uh, they come home, flop into bed with us with their big feet, you know, uh, hanging over the, and uh, we can talk until one or two in the morning, the four of us. Uh, so I would say uh, the thing I do most for my physical health uh, is um, drink in uh, the joy and abundance of my uh, relationships and the people who love me. Friends as well, colleagues. When I went through my cancer, I felt overwhelmed yeah. uh, with love from friends and colleagues. Um, so glad to hear, of course, the good prognosis and, and sorry to hear that you've been through that. I did not know. Yeah. It's uh, significant. That is scary. And yet, as you attest to i'm sure makes the sweet things in life that much sweeter it does it does um when i was going through it i said to my friend carol gilligan well we're all mortal uh but some of us are a little more mortal than others <laughs> yeah. and, uh, uh it's um uh it's brought into uh dramatic uh, relief just what my values are. Yeah. And I write about this. I call this deathbed consciousness. You're fighting with your partner and the phone rings and God forbid uh, the tumor's malignant. You put down the phone and what just happened to the fight? Dissipated, Who yeah. Who cares? Because you have your head on straight. And uh, yeah, nothing like going through what I just went through to get your head on straight. Okay, head on straight. And, and that's our next category is just the mind, um, mental health. And even I've been finding myself saying mental state, just as something do we think about the mental state that we want that we want to grow. And, you know, so as we talked about in our first time together, I mean, you are, it seems like that's a core of what you're doing with a couple, especially we look in front and going, how can I get you in a, the right mental state out of the adaptive child? into the wise and mature adult and into the caring spouse and relational posture of a mental state is, I mean, is that fair to say? It's at the, it's at the core of your entire work. It is, it's about love. I mean, what do we want? We want love. We wanna be loved and we wanna feel love. And uh, everything else is everything else. And it starts with your relationship to you. Yeah. As you know from the book, uh, I talk a lot about what healthy self-esteem is and how to hold yourself tenderly in the face of your imperfections. It's a skill that can be developed. I grew up harshly uh, and I held my, I, I was saying, we tend to hold ourselves the way we were held. Mm -hmm. And I held myself harshly into my, into my 50s. I didn't have healthy self-esteem until my late 40s, early 50s. I learned to hold myself tenderly even when I screwed up and not be harsh. Hey, listen, those of us who are listening and watching this, uh, I like to say this every podcast, if you get nothing 
from this podcast, but what I'm about to say, what I'm about to say has the power to transform many of your lives. So take it seriously. Okay. Here it is. Ready? Yep. There is no redeeming value in harshness. Mm. Nothing good comes from harshness. If it's harsh, it's off. There is nothing that harshness does that loving firmness doesn't do better. So if you're being harsh to someone else, if you're being harsh to yourself, if someone's being harsh to you, change it up, gentle up, confront it, stand up to it in a loving way. You don't meet harshness with harshness. You meet harshness with loving firmness. So at 72, I have a deal with the universe. If it's not kind, I'm not interested. And that goes between me and others, and it goes between my ears. So if I start to rake myself over the coals for some imperfection, I will literally say, because that's the adaptive child part of me, the adaptive child is like a battery. If you were treated harshly, it stores that and then it discharges it. And it's just a little boy. And I will say to that little Terry, hey, hey, hey listen, buddy, hey, you know, uh, say it like you're on my side and I'll listen. But if you say it like you're not on my side, I'm not going to listen. We can, our relationships to relationships in our culture is passive. You get what you get and then you complain about it. We have something to say about what goes on inside our head, what goes on between us and other people. We can change what's happening. That's a revolution. Um, I have to tell you a story. Please. May I? Yes. So I was giving a workshop for therapists, uh, an all-day workshop somewhere, and I was signing books. And one of my handlers said, Terry, Terry, you're going to miss your phone. Oh, my God. And I gather up the my whatever. I, I'm on the plane. Nice glass of Chardonnay. You know, I kick off my shoes. It was a great day. I'm feeling great. And all of a sudden, I feel this wet, cold, ugh, on, on my, and I look down at my shirt. And there's a, 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 a pool of black, wet liquid on my, I had been signing with a Sharpie uh, and I didn't put the lid on. I put the Sharpie in my, and the whole shirt was with permanent. And it was an expensive, it was like one of my um, on Oprah shirts. It was like a couple hundred uh, bucks. Now I have ADD. So I'm always breaking things and losing things and, and I'm depressive. Uh, so that adaptive child part of me, I wouldn't even have identified it then as that, but that adaptive child starts to go to town. You know, I, I say, and I don't want to talk about it. If you hold a stethoscope up to the psyche of a depressed person, what you'll hear is one part of the person endlessly beating up another part of the person. And it's violent in there. And that's what happened. You can't believe it. You're such an idiot. You can't, I can't trust you with anything. You ruin this, you ruin that. And on this day, I lean into that little boy and firmly, but not harshly, I say to him that, hey, listen, the same ADD brain that ruined this shirt is the brain that wrote the books that was being autographed. So how about if you do us both a favor and stand down? And he did. And what might have been a five-day depression in my 20s was solved in five minutes because my relationship to me is not a passive one. I have something to say yeah. about how it goes in here. And I can replace the harsh judgment, stop it, stand up to it. The first time you do it, it'll laugh at you, but the 3,000th time you do it, it will pipe down. I can, I can stop that harshness and then I can summon compassion and care and I can give it to myself. Yeah. And I learned how to do that in my 50s. I used to loathe myself. I used to really hate myself. And I got to tell you, for the last 20 years, uh, it's really pleasant 
in my skin. And that's earned. And no one gave that to me. I had to learn how to do that. And so can you. And everybody listening to this. And everybody reading the book. That line, it's really pleasant in my skin. Who wouldn't want that feeling? Well, you have Who to want that it. feeling. You have to work for it. Well, work is our next category. Okay. And I'm curious with this. As you've talked about that, you do work with a lot of um, very successful individuals in the workplace. And as you said a moment ago, and so many, you spoke to men specifically who have reached untold levels of success. And yet, like your story, the guy had no relational joy, which at the end of the day, it's the, the there's the deathbed desire. It's, there's nothing we want more, nothing we regret more than not having that. And so, uh, with that said, your own work, career, business values in that light. Uh, for me or for our people generally, which both. Like? Well, I mean, it, this sounds uh, grandiose, I guess, but. Um, in terms of my work life, I see myself as a vessel. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I talked a lot uh, in the first hour about trading a paradigm of dominance and control with one of cooperation and collaboration. Right. Uh, and that's spiritual, it's uh, planetary, it's social, it's racial. Um, my metaphor for the new paradigm is art. It's artful. Okay. And I want people to be artful in their relationship. So it goes like this. You are a pianist. You practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. You master your craft. Saturday night rolls, rolls around and you're at the concert and inspiration passes through you and it's magic. You don't own that inspiration. If you act like you, it's yours, that's egotism and you're, you're gonna crash. What you do own is the craft. You work like a dog to master that craft. You're proud of your part of it and you're humble in the face of what comes through you, both at the same time. Mm. Uh, that's my metaphor for, uh, for work. Um, I'll tell you a story. I like to tell a story. Uh, you know from his beautiful introduction to the book that I've worked with Bruce Springsteen. I've had the privilege of working with Bruce and Patty. And I love listening to Bruce talk about his art. I could listen to him for hours, talk about his art. And one of his 8 million sayings that I, I, I've just repeated over and over again is this one. He said to me one day, and I won't do the voice, but so, you know, when you're up on that stage, there's two things. If you don't get any of them, you're done. If you get one without the other, you're done. But if you get both at the same time, literally the same instant, it's magic. I go, okay, what are the two things? Because the first thing is this, this moment, this stage, this chord is the most important moment in the history of the universe. Like, uh, okay, what's the second thing? It's just goddamn rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're a servant to what passes through you. And you're proud of your craft. I'm a very good craftsman. Mm. Uh, and you bow to uh, the inspiration uh, when you're lucky enough to have it come. And it's both. Uh, it's pride in your part of it and humility in what passes through you. Yeah. Yeah. You bring to mind just back to spirituality of is it all and control. Um, yeah. Well, and, back to Taoism. Here's a line. Yeah. 
Uh, the master steps out of the way and lets the Tao speak for itself. Huh. And that's art. Sorry. Okay, another story. Please. I like to tell stories. So this is my favorite story for RLT therapy. This is what I teach my students. It's a Dallas story. So as these stories go, you got a young kid and he wants to be enlightened. And he, the, the great master uh, of his generation happens to be the king's cook. He's the great Dallas master of the land. So the kid goes up to mountains and fights tigers and blah, blah, blah. And he, he gets himself to... Uh, the capital, and he and he goes to the to this great master, and he says, "Master, teach me about the Tao." And the master looks at the kid and goes, "All right, grab a knife, let's cook." And as these stories go, a year goes by, and now the kid's getting frustrated. And one afternoon, he throws down his cooking gear, and he turns to the master and goes, "God damn it!" I came here a year ago to learn about the Tao. And for a year, all we've done is cook. When am I going to learn about the Tao? The master looks at him and says, stupid boy. He says, let me ask you a question. Remember, this is about therapy and work. Let me ask you a question. How many times do you sharpen your knife? He goes, I don't know, four or five times a day. Yeah. How many times have you watched me sharpen my knife? The kid goes, uh, I've never seen you sharpen. Because that's right. Because, because your knife cuts things. My knife finds the space between them. That's work. Be in the flow. Wow. We had Stephen Kotler on the show not long ago, he has the flow Institute and it's amazing since then, how often the word comes up in the shows authentically like this. Um, thank you for that. And I would take that right into the next category of money, finances, wealth, how we view that, how that relates to our, I'd almost ask the question relates to our relational joy or lack thereof, the pursuit of, t tell me. Well, look, first of all, uh, uh, I'm not so what my wife calls spiritual Wawa, she's from California, uh, that uh, I'm going to say, well, we're all abundant. Look, there are real social constraints on people, marginalized people, yeah. uh, people of color. Uh, and not having money grinds you down. I grew up in poverty. Uh, and uh, it's, it's terrible when, when your life uh, is um, oppressed uh, and, and you don't have a reasonable amount of resources. Um, you know, not to whatever, but I have a friend who's Danish and uh, Denmark, uh, uh, Finland, uh, Norway are the happiest people on the planet. And they're, they're taken care of, cradle to grave. Uh, you can work in a little you know, bookstore uh, and make not much money, but you'll have a comfortable place to live and medical care and you'll be all right. So basic, human, it goes back to safety. Yeah. Uh, basic human needs need to be met and people need access to uh, uh, a fundamental uh, health, financial health. On the other extreme, healthy self-esteem comes from the inside out. I have worth because I'm here, I'm a human being and uh, my worth cannot be added to, it cannot be subtracted from, it's an existential spiritual fact. I'm no better or worse than anybody else. Our culture runs on unhealthy self-esteem, outside in self-esteem. Yeah. Performance-based esteem, big for men, I have worth because of what I can do. Uh, sounds like you had some of that in your childhood. 
uh, other base the same, big for women. I have worth because you think I do. Uh, and attribute base the same. I have worth because of what I have. The whole okay. advertising business is built on attribute based by this car and be right. a person of distinction. It's all bullshit. I have worth because I'm here and I'm breathing. And if you, like so many of us, tie your sense of worth and well being to your bank account or your accomplishments or your success or, 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 uh, you're in for a rocky ride. It has nothing to do with any of that. So on the one hand, uh, if you're socially barred from a reasonable, healthy, comfortable existence, you're impoverished, uh, we need to do something about that collectively and not blame the person on the bottom end of the spectrum for that. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this notion uh, that what I have makes me a better person is uh, poison. Uh, and it will rob us of our happiness. Yeah. Happiness. What does Terry Real do for fun? In addition uh, to jumping in bed with his wife in the evening and watching a good flick and, and snuggling and whatnot, but what do you do for uh, just fun, just play? that somewhat non-productive. I think you actually write about this in the book. You don't say non-productive. There's another word that you use, but, uh, but it was something like that, but to play, to fun. Yeah, it's about being, it's not about doing. Okay. Uh, we, after you know, a, lot of, a long career and a lot of work, uh, my wife and I have a beautiful little house in, on the island of Martha's Vineyard uh, off the Cape in Massachusetts. Uh, man, Give me a long walk on the beach with my feet in the water and uh, my wife and maybe even uh, a friend alongside of me. I can go for miles, mm. just miles. Uh, I love that beach. I love Martha Vineyard. I love to go biking, kayaking uh, before my surgery is tennis. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have a big screened in porch in, in that house. And uh, what we love to do is get a whole bunch of people together. And uh, there may be some recreational substances of some kind or another, uh, uh, some drinking involved. And everybody cooks. We put on music and everybody dances, including kids. Uh, and we all cook together. We make a fabulous meal. We sit down on that screen and porch, light some candles, and talk into the wee hours of the morning. Uh, man, a New England hot summer's night uh, on that screened in porch with good food, good wine, and a bunch of friends uh, can't be beat. I, I, would, I would be there. I would be there. You yeah. should come. You. I should I come. You're I invited. That, uh, I don't think it gets much better than that uh, for me as well either. There's a night like that with people you love and care about. Thank you. Thank you for your time, for your heart, for your candor, um, and, uh, and for the guidance you shared too here. I'm incredibly grateful and incredibly honored, Terry. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I'm taking it in. Uh, and um, uh, you are really a light. Hmm. Uh, you shine. And you've got a big heart and you're open and you're appreciative uh, and you're discriminating and you're smart. Uh, and uh, there's a reason why so many people are drawn to you and listen to you. I think you're doing really great work on this planet. And I, uh, I want to appreciate you and the work you're doing. Keep it up. Terry, thank you. Thank you. Blessings to you. It's a pleasure.